course. Training is defined as an organized activity aimed at imparting information and or instructions to improve the recipient's performance or to help him or her attain a required level of knowledge or skill. So, the definition is basically saying that training is concerned with improving an individual's present skill. Now, Koji, can you tell can you tell us about development? Sure. So development is this activity focuses upon activities that the organization employing the individual or that the individual is part of may partake in the future. Development aims to be a step ahead to prepare for the activities that may occur in the future. So based on these definitions, we can say that training and development are both very different terms. Training is basically concerned with the present, while development is more concerned with future improvements. So to give you a concrete definition, training and development is combined role often called human resource development or HRD, meaning the development of human resources to remain competitive in a marketplace. Now, as mentioned, training and development is a function of HRD or the human resource development. Given this, you must be able to aware of the terms career development and organizational development. So first, what is career development? So, career development is a lifelong process of managing your or your employee's work experience within or between organizations. Second is organizational development. So, Rachel, please tell me something about organizational development. Yes, organizational development is a theory and practice of plan, systematic change in the attitudes, beliefs, and values of the employees through creation and reinforcement of long-term training programs. In addition to that, organizational development is also action-oriented. It starts with a careful organization-wide analysis of the current situation and of the future requirements and employs techniques of behavioral sciences such as modeling, sensitivity training, and transactional analysis. Its objective is to enable the organization in adopting better the fast-changing external environment of new markets, regulations, and technologies. So to help you further set a good foundation about training and development, let's discuss the concept of knowledge, skills, and other characteristics, or the case of the KSOX model is a com competency model of individual. KSOX is the same as KSA model. And you also know that KSOX include knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics that an applicant must have to perform successfully in the position. So can you please tell me the acronym of each letters? So KSOX, the K in KSOX stands for knowledge. Knowledge which is a body of information that can be applied directly to the performance of tasks. Well, the S in case of means Skills, or which is defined as a proficient manual, verbal, or mental manipulation of people, ideas, or things. And for A A stands for abilities, which, be, which are the present power to perform a job function, to carry through with the activity while applying or using the associated knowledge. And last but not the least, other characteristics are a general category for other personal factors such as personality, willingness, interest, and motivation, and such tangible factors as licenses, degrees, and years or of experience. So for more learnings about training and development, you can visit the link that will be flashed on the screen. In this section, we will define training and its purpose, as well as the basic training process. Included within this process is how organizations identify training needs and select, implement, and evaluate training programs. Training is the process of teaching employees the basic skills they need to perform their jobs or for developing additional skills. The firm's training programs must make sense in terms of the company's strategic goals. For example, if one of the goals of the company is to expand its international market, then one of the things they may focus on is training their employees in multiple languages. Also, training is part of the larger issue of performance management. This is an integrated, goal-oriented approach to assigning, training, assessing, and rewarding employees' performance. Managers set goals for their employees, and training is one of the ways an organization helps an employee meet those goals. The training process includes these five steps.
It is important that each step in the process be completed thoroughly because each builds on the other. The more time and effort spent on the previous step, the better the next steps can be. Step 1, Needs Analysis, identifies the training needs of an employee. The two main ways of identifying those needs are through a task analysis and a performance analysis. The task analysis is a detailed study of a job to identify the specific skills required, especially for new employees. A task analysis record form can also be used. Here is an example of this form for a printing press operator. The task analyses contain the following information, a task list, when and how often each task is performed, the quantity and quality of performance expected, the working conditions, the skills or knowledge required, and where those can be best learned. The second type of needs analysis is a performance analysis. The goal here is to verify if there is a performance deficiency and to determine whether that deficiency should be corrected through training or through some other means, such as transferring the employee. There are several methods that can be used to identify an employee's training needs, including 360-degree performance reviews, job-related performance data, observations by supervisors or other specialists, and tests of things like job knowledge and skills. When beginning the discussion of what types of training methods to use, there are several tips to keep in mind to make the training more effective. First, the learning needs to be meaningful. Material that is meaningful is usually easier for trainees to understand and remember. For example, it is important at the start of training to provide a bird's eye view of the material to be presented. It is also valuable to use a variety of familiar examples and to organize the information so it can be presented logically and in meaningful units. Second, it is imperative to design the training to make it easy for the skills being learned to transfer from the training site to the job site. This can be accomplished by maximizing the similarity between the training environment and the work situation and by providing time for adequate practice. It is also important to provide a heads up or some preparatory information that lets trainees know what problems or situations may occur on the job. Lastly, it is important to motivate the learner. This is easily done by defining for the learner why the training is important and how it will benefit them. People learn best by doing, so provide as much realistic practice as possible and allow them to learn at their own pace. Trainees also learn best when the trainers immediately reinforce correct responses. With this in mind, take a look at several different methods organizations can use when designing their training. I will not spend time discussing all of them as you can read about them in your text, but understand that each method has advantages and disadvantages. Thus, depending on the situation, each method can be a valuable tool for teaching employees new skills and behaviors. Step 3 is the validation process. By now the term validity should be a familiar one. We discussed this in great detail during the selection chapter when we talked about how organizations create valid selection measures for hiring new employees. In order to determine a training's validity, the company must test the training on a sample of employees to see if those who receive the training have better performance on the job than those who did not receive the training. This sampling process should be conducted on multiple groups to make sure the training is valid. Implementation, step four, is the easiest to do if all previous steps have been done well. Now we simply need to train the employees that need to learn this skill or behavior. It is important to schedule the training at a time when the employee is fresh and that the training is broken down into small segments to lower the chance of fatigue. Step five, evaluating the training, is the most overlooked step. In many instances, organizations will spend a lot of time and resources on the first four steps and then completely forget about what is arguably the most important part of the training process. My point is that it makes no sense for organizations to spend hundreds or even tens of thousands of dollars on designing a training program to not have any proof that the training actually has proven results. There are four basic ways to measure training effectiveness. The first is the trainee's reaction to or perception of the training. Did they like it? Did they enjoy it? These reactions are very similar to the types of evaluations you complete at the end of every semester on your teachers. The second way is to measure the trainee's learning. This can be done by testing the individual's knowledge of the material covered. Third is to assess the trainee's behavior. Are they using the skills or behavior they learn in the training in the actual work environment? Lastly, organizations should measure the results or outcomes of the training. In other words, did those who participated in the training actually improve their job performance? This is an example of a time series experiment. Before training, the company measures employee performance several times. In a perfect world, this is what all organizations hope to see as a result of training. 
Ultimately, what organizations want to see is a significant increase in employee performance, which is illustrated on the right side of the graph. In the end, if organizations can't track this and understand how training is affecting performance, then the training is not as effective as it could be. In conclusion, today we have discussed the basics of designing and implementing a training program. It is a complicated and time-consuming process, but in the end, a well-constructed training program is worth the effort, which must include all five steps. Today, we will be discussing about organizational needs. To start off, what is a need? There are two types of needs, felt and actual needs. Felt needs is about an individual's or group's belief that they need something. This relies heavily upon an individual's own perception of their need and their perception of any discrepancy between what their situation may be and what their situation should be. This definition is very similar to A1. Actual needs, on the other hand, refer to a family that is turned into a express need, which is then initiated by some form of action or event. This often concerns access to resources or services by order to meet the need. In relation to this, in terms of there is also what we call typology of
link between COVID and HIV actions. Third, it strengthens corporate support for HIV and lastly, it makes HIV more of a revenue generator, not a public waste. That's why. How about the sources of organizational information? There are seven sources of organizational information. It includes mission statement, HR inventory, skills inventory, quality of working life indicator, efficiency, and access system changes and exit interviews. We now move on to task analysis. You mentioned earlier that it also answers the question, what must be done to perform the job effectively? May I know why? Because it provides data about a job or a group of jobs and the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and abilities needed to achieve optimal performance. I see. So what is a variety of sources for collecting data for a task analysis? We have a total of nine sources. First, we have job description. It is a narrative statement of the major activities involved in performing the job and the conditions under which these activities are performed. If an accurate job description is not available or is out of date, one should be prepared using job analysis techniques. Second is KSA analysis. It is a more detailed list of specified tasks for each job including knowledge, skills, attitudes, and abilities required. Third is performance standards. It is the objectives of the task of the job and the standards by which they will be judged. This is needed to identify performance discrepancies. Fourth, observe the job. Next is perform the job. Job inventory questionnaire is another source of collecting data. It evaluates tasks in terms of importance and time spent performing. Next, review literature about the job. You can do this by researching the best practices from another companies. Review professional journals. Next, ask questions. And the last source will be the analysis of problems. For example, downtime, waste, repairs, late deliveries, quality control. Now that we have discussed about organizational and task analysis, let's now go to the last level of assessment, which is person analysis. You have mentioned earlier that person analysis determines training needs for specific individuals, right? Yes. So among the sources of information available for individual analysis, what is the most effective? I think the most effective is performance appraisal. What is performance appraisal? It is a method by which the job performance of an employee is document, doc documented and evaluated. This is very important to the company and to the individual. Here is the process for performance appraisal. First, you have to determine the basis for appraisal. Once you have done the first step, you may now conduct the appraisal. Then you have to determine the discrepancies between the standard and the performance. You also have to identify sources of discrepancies. The last step on the process is selecting ways to resolve discrepancies. I see. So conducting a training needs assessment requires gathering data to organization, task, and person per learner level. Working in each level includes specific questions, data sources, and collection methods. So in order to have a comprehensive and effective needs assessment, how many levels of needs assessment must be interrelated? Yes, you are right. Just remember that needs assessment is the first step in the establishment of the training and development program because it's used as a foundation for determining instructional objectives, the selection and design of instructional programs, the implementation of the programs, and the evaluation of the training provided. Therefore, pre-assessment is not enough because the more types of need you consider, the richer the planning process and the more effective the training. Thank you so much for all your views and I really appreciate your time with me. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it and I look forward to have more conversations with you. Thanks for watching everyone. See you all next time. Drop up. Let's all watch it. We've all been through training in our jobs before, but how did the organization decide that training was needed in the first place? In this video, we're going to briefly discuss how organizations decide what their learning needs are and whether those needs can be met through training. The process of systematically evaluating these needs is called needs assessment or sometimes needs analysis.
Before getting into needs assessment, let's step back and look at the training as a three-phase process. In the first phase, the assessment phase, we take stock of what our organization's needs are that might be met through training. This will be the focus of the rest of the video. After we've determined our needs, we then move on to the implementation phase. Here, we develop our training program, or possibly choose a pre-existing one depending on our needs, and we actually deliver the training. Finally, we want to evaluate our program to ensure that it met our objectives. See the other video for a discussion on how to evaluate training success. Based on what we learn, we may then return to the implementation phase to improve our program for the future. Now I should note that this is a prescriptive model. In other words, it says what should happen in organizations. Sadly, most of the time, companies only focus on the actual delivery of training. In other words, training is often neither well-planned nor properly evaluated for quality. So let's take a look at the assessment phase. Deciding where our training needs are can happen at three levels. At the highest level is organizational analysis which refers to looking at the organization's goals and determining whether training is part of the plan for achieving those goals. Upper level management usually decides what those goals are based on observed problems or strategic plans. The goal here is to align training efforts with the overarching set of objectives for that organization. Forward thinking organizations will also ensure that there's adequate support for the training such as resources to make up for the employee's time away from the job while they're being trained, and supervisor support for employees to practice what they've learned in training. At the second level is task and KSAO analysis. Based on information about major tasks and responsibilities, as well as important KSAOs, we can decide which of these things we wouldn't expect new employees to have when they start working for us. This might include working with job-specific pieces of equipment or knowing company policies and procedures. We can then move forward with the development of a training program to get them up to speed on these tasks or to provide them with these KSAOs. This may sound familiar to you. It might sound a lot like job analysis. And yes, job analysis would be a perfect source of this kind of information. And note that task and KSAO analysis identifies training that everyone in a particular position will need. It's not focused on an individual person. For that, we go to the third level, which is person analysis. As the name implies, person analysis focuses on what training needs particular employees might have. This type of analysis probably comes from some form of performance appraisal. During that process, deficiencies may be uncovered and that employee may be sent to training to bring him or her up to a satisfactory level. But person analysis doesn't always have a remedial flavor to it. It could be based on other needs. For example, a work group may need to have an expert on a particular topic and sending one member of the group to training may accomplish this. Also, training can often be used to groom someone for a future promotion to a higher level job. Finally, once the needs assessment has been conducted, the behavioral objectives of the training program should be specified. These objectives state what the desired outcome of the training is in terms of employee behavior. In other words, what should employees who go through the training be able to do now that they've gone through the training that they couldn't do before? So, for example, if a retail company is training employees to use a new cash register system, they might have the following behavioral objectives for the training program. First, be able to process cash, credit, or check transactions. Be able to do this at a 95% accuracy rate. And use proper voiding procedures in case of an error. Whatever the behavioral objectives are, stating them clearly and in advance will help you to choose and design an appropriate training program. It'll also help you be clear with the trainees about what they will be able to do once they complete the program. It will allow you to properly evaluate the success of the program since you've already specified what trainees should be able to do. And finally, it'll help you better sell your plan to management. That's it for this video on training needs assessment. Thanks for watching.
If you thought that we could go right away thinking about how to do the training, that's incorrect. Of course, before anything else, you have to design your objectives and how the training will flow. After identifying that needs of your trainees, you, know, you now have to think about what you want them to know after conducting the training. You have to have clear objectives of what you want for them and how this will be achieved. So first, let's talk about creating your learning objectives. Learning objectives can be defined as a statement of what students will be able to do when they have completed instruction. A learning objective has three major components. First, a description of what the student will be able to do. Second, the conditions under which the student will perform the task. And last, the criteria for evaluating student performance. So how does one write a learning objective? First, bear in mind that three components must always be present. There are the performance, conditions, and the criteria. Let me elaborate further on how to properly write a learning objective. So in writing, in writing a learning objective, first, focus on student performance, not teacher performance. Second, focus on product, not process. And third, focus on terminal behavior, not subject matter. But not the subject matter. And last but not least, include only a general learning outcome in each objective. Prepare your learning objectives, a teaching resource provided by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Planning, and there are three characteristics essential to ensuring clear states, statements of objectives. First is the performance. An objective must be must describe the competency to be learned in performance terms. The choice of a verb is all important here. Such frequently used terms as no, understand, grasp, and appreciate do not meet this requirement. If the verb used in stating an objective identifies an observable student behavior, then the basis for a clear statement is established. So next is the criteria. An objective should make clear how well the learner must perform to be judged adequately. This can be done with a statement indicating a degree of accuracy, a quantity or proportion of correct responses for the like. Lastly is the condition. An objective should, be, should describe the conditions under which the learner will, ex, will be expected to perform in the evaluation situation. What tools, references, or other aids will be provided for the night should be made clear. For example, objective. Given a set of data, the student will be able to complete the standard deviation. Condition. Given a set of data. With the behavior, the student will be able to complete the standard deviation. So criteria, it should be applied. The number completed will be correct. To help you further use this checklist for writing a specific instruction of objective, First, begin each statement of a specific learning outcome with a verb that specifies definite, observable behavior. Make sure that each statement meets all three of the criteria for a good learning objective. Observable behavior, the conditions under which the student will be expected to perform, and the criteria to be used for evaluation of the student's performance. Number three, be sure to include complex objectives, appreciation, problem solving, etc. when they are appropriate. Now, have you heard of Bloom's taxonomy? Educators and psychologists concerned with learning theory have given considerable thought to the various types of learning that takes place in schools. Probably, the most comprehensive and widely known analysis of objectives is the taxonomy of educational objectives by Benjamin Bloom and others. Bloom's taxonomy provides a consistent means of developing the single most powerful tool in instruction and the assessment of student learning outcomes the learning or performance objective. The taxonomy distinguishes between three major categories of objectives termed the cognitive domain, the psychomotor domain, domain, and the affective domain. So the affective domain is concerned about beliefs, attitudes, and values. Psychomotor is concerned with learning of physical movements such as ballet steps, how to pitch a curve ball, how to drill out a cavity in a motor, and etc. And cognitive domain is concerned with information and in the process of so, why is Bloom's taxonomy necessary in writing learning objectives? Bloom's taxonomy was created in 1956 under the leadership of educational psychologist Dr. Benjamin Bloom in order to promote higher forms of thinking in education, such as analyzing and evaluating, rather than just remembering facts. Bloom's taxonomy would provide the different levels of learning based on the three learning domains. These levels of learning should be considered in writing your objectives to identify up to what level must be reached in accordance with your objectives. Note that you cannot skip any levels. 
If ever you decide that you should use up to level 3 or 4 of any domains, you can skip the levels prior to those. It will then up to your judgment of what levels must be covered. Now that we have tackled how to write objectives and how to write them using Bloom's taxonomy, let's go to deciding how the training will go. The training flow should be defined before going through anything. To organize the flow properly, one must use the process sheet. Now, what is a process sheet? A process sheet is a tool with which combines factors to aid the trainer in the preparation of the actual conduct of the training program. The process sheet involves the type, objectives, key topics, methodology, material, and the remarks. Let me show you an example. struggle with creating student learning outcomes that are clear, that are concise, and that eliminate guessing for the learner. I know it may feel a bit daunting to revise statements that perhaps need some adjustment, and there's perhaps overhead also that you may need a channel through to just accomplish that. Or you just may think that there's no need for you to rewrite your SLOs, but I challenge you to think back at the times you wish the results of your learner's performance was a bit different. and what you may have been able to do to make that possible. Robert Major said in one of his books on preparing instructional objectives, he says, if instruction doesn't change anyone, it has no effect, no power. If it changes a student in undesired rather than in desired directions, it isn't called effective. And as I think about this, I think about the coach and the athlete scenario. The coach says, you flunk. And the athlete says, but I ran the 100-yard dash like you said. And then the coach says, true, but you were slow. The athlete says, but you didn't say how fast we had to run. The coach responds with, would I ask you to run if I didn't want you to run fast? You should have known that the speed was important. In this example, it would make a difference to have mentioned speed as a factor in meeting the objective. So, a good way of stating the expectation could be athletes are expected to be able to run the 100-yard dash on a dry track within 14 seconds. If this scenario is all too familiar to you as an instructor, then it's very likely that your expectations are not stated in clear, concise, or measurable terms. Your learners might not be to blame all the time for their shortcomings. It might just be that you were not clear in stating what exactly they need to do. So you've probably had learners come into your office upset about the grade they earned on their project or on their assignment. And it's more than likely that they were probably unsure about what the expectation was to begin with. But when you have a clear and specific and measurable student learning outcome, there's very little room for misunderstanding. When you can create a clear SLO, it really is a win-win for both you and your learners. It may seem to you, the instructor, that perhaps writing a student learning outcome is like trying to solve a mathematical equation. But I'm here to show you that it is much more simple than that. I will show you just how simple it can be with my explanation of the three components of a student learning outcome and the three steps you can take to get started on your journey to writing effective student learning outcomes. So first, let's look at performance. The performance component is something that you want to think about when you approach your learning outcomes. And when you think of performance, think about action. When you think of performance, think about verbs like these. 
All these words describe an action and are critical to the student learning outcome. When you think about performance in light of creating your student learning outcome, think about behaviors that are observable and that are measurable. These words here accomplish that. So think of specific actions you want your learners to do. Do you want them to sew? Do you want them to count? Do you want them to sort? What will they be expected to do? What do you want your learners to aim for? Your student learning outcome statement ought to specify what target you want your learners to hit. And when you accomplish this, you've hit your target too. So, for instance, I could say, at the end of this tutorial, you will be able to identify the three components of an effective learning outcome. And here, the key word is identify. It is the action. It is the verb. It's the performance. This word tells the learner exactly what I need them to do. So with that said, let's move on to criterion. When you think of criterion, think about the standard you want your learners to meet for any given assignment or activity. When you think about criterion, think about how well your learner must do something in order to be successful. So criterion, think about it in terms of quantity, cost, or time. So, for instance, I could say you must score at least 75% on each assessment drill in order to successfully complete this learning activity. The key word here is 75%. 75% is the quantity, it is the standard, it is the criterion of that particular statement. So, moving on to the last component of an effective student learning outcome, and that is condition. Let's look at condition. When you think about condition, consider what limitations the learner will have in order to complete any given outcome. Think about condition in terms of a given or a not given. Think about it in terms of resources, tools, equipment, or materials. So for instance, I could say, you will use the PDF guide to compose your own SLOs. The keyword here is PDF guide. The PDF guide is the limitation it's the given and it's the condition. So we've covered all the components of an effective student learning outcome. We've covered performance, criterion, and condition. All these three statements that we just reviewed harmoniously become one SLO that sounds clear and vivid. As you can see, I've combined the three components of an effective SLO to create this complete statement. The first statement is the performance, the second one is the criterion, and the last one is the condition. So now that you know what the three components are of a student learning outcome, it's time you did some writing yourself. As you begin, ask yourself what are the most important things a learner should know? What should they be able to do? Or what should they be able to demonstrate after they complete an assignment or a task or an activity? So step one, you want to ask yourself, as a result of blank, learners will be able to blank. The next step would be to draft your SLO. And we can fill in the blanks of the previous slide by saying, as a result of participation in this activity, learners will be able to list the three components of an effective SLO. So here you notice that we focused on one activity for this example as we think about it in terms of results. In other words, what would I be looking for in the learners who view this tutorial? How would I be able to measure their understanding or knowledge? And I can measure their understanding or knowledge by seeing that they have listed the three components. If they can successfully list the three components, then I know that they've mastered the material. Finally, step three lets you reference this checklist after creating your SLO. And the checklist is right here. Did I focus on outcomes, not processes? Then, does the outcome have at least one verb? And we already talked about that in the performance component. And finally, did I avoid vague verbs like know and understand? The vague verbs of know and understand are not measurable. How would you gauge that a learner knows something? And how would you gauge that a learner understands something? We see these verbs written all over the place, and they really don't say much 
These terms don't allow you to measure an outcome, but they rather create confusion and disappointment in the long term because they're so vague. They're just not saying much about what your expectation is. This is as simple as I can put it, and I, I really do hope this helps. I know a lot of instructors fear being misunderstood, and moreover, they just don't look forward to the complaints of students when they are questioned about the results of their projects or assignments. But it can only get better for your class if you make explicit your expectations by using these three components of an effective SLO. If you strive to put these into practice every time you design and develop your course, you'll be sure to see better results. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you these tips on creating effective student learning outcomes. This ends our discussion.
down with the first category, which is the OJT. That's now proceed to classroom training. There are five approaches in classroom training lecture. Lecture discussion, audiovisual methods, experimental methods, and the computer-based training. Let's go through each method one by one. First is the lecture method. Lecture is the oral presentation of the training materials, which may also include visual aids. It is one of the most popular and widely used classroom based methods since it is one of the simplest methods of transferring a lot of information in a limited amount of time. Lecture presents disadvantages as well. This is not a very interactive method. It uses one-way communication, which limits the trainee's participation. The trainer must keep in mind to always motivate the trainees to listen, given that not everyone is always willing to trust seats and listen. The second method of classroom training is discussion. Discussion is very similar to lecturing. However, discussion facilitates training trainer interaction. Unlike lecturing discussion, it utilizes two-way communication and it also uses a variety of questions to keep control of the lesson. Questions used are direct, which generates direct and narrow responses, reflective questions, and open-ended questions. Like lecturing, discussion also presents disadvantages. Discussion means maintaining control in larger classes, quite challenging since everyone has their own opinions about the discussion. Discussion also requires a skilled facilitator, and it entails more time than lecture. The next method is called the audiovisual media. The audiovisual media will be very helpful for trainees since it brings visual senses into play along with audio senses. This method has three types of the static media, dynamic media, and telecommunications. Static media means use of printed materials like lecture notes, work aids, and handouts. PowerPoint and overview, overhead transparencies can also be some examples of it. The dynamic media means use of materials that can demonstrate the lesson through audio cassettes, CDs, films, video tape, DVD, and etc. Last is the telecommunication. Telecommunication makes use of materials for technology that can facilitate the training without the trainer being actually there. Examples of these are instructional TV, teleconferencing, and video There is also a training method called experiential, experiential training. From the name itself, the training method, uh, method utilizes experience to generate learning. Exper uh, experiential method can be done in five ways. Case studies, business game simulation, role playing, behavior modeling, and last is the outdoor training. From the names of these methods, you can easily tell how you, you will learn through experience. Thus, discuss each method one by one. Number one, in case studies, the case study method is a method which provides scripted situations which stimulates trainees to make decisions. The purpose of the case method is to make trainees apply what they know, develop new ideas to manage a situation, or solve a problem. The focus is more on the approach uh, the training uses rather than on the solution. As a training tool, the case study method can be used to develop decision making skills, enhance team, team spirit, better communication and interpersonal skills, and strengthen the analytical skills of trainees. In using this method, we must consider the specific instructional objectives, case approach, objectives, the attributes of case, the learning characteristics instructional timing, training environment, and the facilitator's characteristics. Number two is the business game simulations. Business simulation games are games that focus on the management of economic process, usually in the form of a business. Your business simulations have been described as construction and management simulation without this construction element, and can thus be called management simulations. The interest in this game lies in accurate simulation of real-world events using algorithms as well as the close tie of players' actions to expected or possible consequences and outcomes. The third is role-playing. Role-playing will give you 
complete package of learning by knowing what really it is like to do what you are being trained to do. It also helps the trainer to identify whether the trainee has gained the knowledge of what is being taught through applying it in role playing. Rule based helps self discovery because it allows you to be as flexible as you can. It makes use of interpersonal skills, which is a plus. Some trainees who are better actors, some will be able to better showcase their learnings through acting than written exams. The next is behavior modeling. Behavior modeling is the process that was featured to criticize behavior. This method assures that trainees are not only by doing, but by watching what others do. Behavior modeling is used mainly for interpersonal skills training. The last method under experimental training is called the outdoor education. Outdoor education usually refers to organized learning that takes place in the outdoors. Outdoor education's quality in terms of learning is still questionable since it does not really provide their own learning experience. Rather, it just tries to get the trainees to have fun. This method may involve both sources, etc. The best things this method presents is that it can facilitate teamwork, focus on group problem identification, and problem solving. Now, let's go to the next method in the three basic training methods. The self-paced training. Self-paced training from the name itself, the training has a control on the pace of the training. It can be done through more copy examples of which or correspondent courses and program instructions. It can also be done through computer-based training or CV, examples of which are computer-aided instructions and internet or intranet training. Let me now present first the characteristics of the hard copy type of self-paced training. The hard copy is good for remote locations without internet access. You get a hold of the training module personally where you can open, open it whenever you want without you need for a laptop or a tablet or any other gadget and the internet. The hard copy is still being used. However, it is being slowly replaced by computer-based training. The, individu uh, the individu individual gets to follow the text at his or her own pace in the hard copy method. The other type of self-paced training is the computer-based training. Unlike the hard copy, the computer-based training is interactive with the user since it makes use of technology. The first uh, allowing communication. The CPT can be used when and where user wants it, and it lets the training gain greater control over progress. The CPT can actually be also cost-effective since it minimizes the use of classroom, printed materials, etc. There are actually three types of computer-based training. They are computer-aided instruction, internet and internet-based training, and intelligent computer-assisted instruction. The computer-aided instruction includes the use of computers to teach academic skills and to promote communication and language development and skills. It includes computer modeling and computers to tutors. It uses a real and practice approach. Basically, this is a read only presentation of a classic training program. Instructions are given using Word documents and other manuals where every instruction is just written. This is very effective for multimedia courses as well. Next is the internet and internet based training or the e learning. Internet is collection of computer networks within organizations. And internet uses network technologies as a tool to facilitate, facilitate communication between people or work groups to improve the data sharing capability and overall knowledge base of, the, of our organization's employees. Internet can also be used for general communication purposes. Instructions and questions can be presented through the organization's site or they may also be presented informally through social media like Facebook chats. The internet is also a great reference that will provide the trainees the missing knowledge needed to improve themselves. The last type of computer based training is the intelligent computer assisted instructions. Intelligent computer assisted instructions uses artificial intelligence techniques to initiate in computer form the power of human tutorial process. 
its major technical features are the use of mod modularized knowledge based instead of CAI's textual scripts and the ability to interpret students' statements and questions expressed in natural English. These features make CAI systems extremely flexible and allow the students much greater learning control of the interaction than the traditional possible in CAI. That concludes our discussion about the different learning approaches. Do keep in mind that deciding on which learning approach to use should be decided carefully. Your training success will depend on its as much as it would depend on your objectives. Let's now present how you should implement your learning approach. Every activity we do has its own proper way of doing than those of its good training. Training has its own code of ethics that must be followed on every learning approach to be using. The simplest study, sitting, walking, and talking, I have specific ways to be done to assure that you are doing your training properly and good in the eyes of your audience. Bye. 
Thousand positions effects can be annoying, used sparingly. Animation effects can be interesting when used in moderation. Too much animation is destructive. Insert video and audio clips into PowerPoint. Don't get distracted by audience noises or movements. If you 
If you temporarily lose your train of thought, you can gain time to recover by asking the Ojestas any questions. For, uh, for your conclusion, concisely summarize your key concepts and the main ideas of your presentation. Resist the temptation to add a few nasty from the words. End your talk with a summary statement or questions you have prepared. What do you want them to do? What do you want them to be to remember? Consider, uh, consider alternative to questions. For your closing slide, a summary of your key points, a cartoon, a team logo, or a company logo may be stronger. Those are just the basic tips you must keep in mind to make your creating program successful. A creating program successful not always be a one of content or the trainings. Most of what the outcome will be will rely on you, the trainer. Bear in mind that the planning does not prevent failure. Planning only makes it easier to avoid failure. Planning your HRD implementation before you actually do it greatly increases the likelihood of successful implementation. So plan, plan, plan. This ends our discussion about creating and development. To help you better in doing a good presentation, please watch this. Anyone who has watched a Steve Jobs keynote will tell you he is one of the most extraordinary speakers in corporate America. Who does the best job of that in the world? While most presenters simply convey information, Jobs inspires. I'm Carmine Gallo, and today I'll walk you through several key techniques that Steve Jobs uses to electrify his audience. There are elements you can adopt in your very next presentation. Welcome to Macworld 2008. We've got some, some great stuff for you. There's clearly something in the air today. With those words, Jobs opened Macworld 2008, setting the theme for his presentation and hinting at the major announcement of the day, the launch of the ultra-thin MacBook Air. Whether it's a new notebook or the iPhone, Jobs unveils a single headline that sets the theme. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Once you identify a theme, make sure it's clear and consistent throughout the presentation. Think of a staff meeting as a presentation. So let's say you're a sales manager introducing a new software tool to help your team generate, track, and share sales leads. You might kick off your meeting this way. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I know you'll be really excited about this. Today we make it easier for you to make your quota. That's the headline. Easier to make quota. It's memorable and it sets the direction for the rest of your meeting. It gives your audience a reason to listen. So I've got four things I'd like to talk about with you today. Let's get started. Steve Jobs always provides an outline for his presentation and then verbally opens and closes each section with a clear transition in between. Here's an example. So that's time capsule, a perfect companion to leopard, and that's the first thing I wanted to share with you this morning. The point is, make it easy for your listeners to follow your story. Your outline will serve as guideposts along the way. You'll also notice that during his presentations, Jobs uses words like extraordinary, extraordinary amazing, amazing, and cool. He is passionate, enthusiastic, and it shows. Incredible, unbelievable, amazing, awesome, extraordinary year for Apple. You know, your audience wants to be wowed, not put to sleep. Too many people fall into this presentation mode. It's stiff, it's formal, it lacks pizzazz. We, your listeners, are giving you permission to have fun and to be excited about your company, your product, or your service. If you're not passionate about it, we're not going to be. Remember, Jobs isn't selling hardware. He's selling an experience. If you offer numbers and statistics, make them meaningful. We have sold four million iPhones to date. To divide four million by 200 days, that's 20,000 iPhones every day on average. Numbers don't mean much unless they're placed in context. 
Managers, connect the dots for your listeners. Recently, I worked with a company that launched a 12 gigabyte memory card. 12 gigabytes! That number doesn't mean much to most people, so we put it into context. We said that's enough memory to listen to your music while traveling to the moon and back. Now, 12 gigs means something to me. Make numbers meaningful. One of the most effective elements of a Steve Jobs presentation is that they are easy on the eyes. His presentations are visual and simple. While most speakers fill their slides with mind-numbing data and text and charts, Jobs does just the opposite. He uses very little text and usually one, maybe two images per slide. You see, you want to paint a picture for your audience without overwhelming them. Inspiring presentations are short on bullet points and big on visuals. If you really want your presentation to pop, treat it like a show with ebbs and flows, themes and transitions. Jobs includes video clips, demonstrations and guests. He also has a knack for dramatic flair and it's very effective. For example, when introducing the MacBook Air, Jobs drew cheers by opening a manila inter-office envelope and holding the laptop out for everyone to see. This is the new MacBook Air, and you can get a feel for how thin it is. What is the one memorable moment of your presentation? Identify it ahead of time, then build up to it. With a little help from our friends, everything will work today. And finally, rehearse, rehearse, and rehearse some more. Let me show you how easy that is now. Steve Jobs makes it look easy because he spends hours rehearsing. He cannot pull off an intricate presentation with video clips and demonstrations and outside speakers without practice. The result, a presentation that is perfectly synchronized and looks, yes, effortless. Now, the average business person does not have the resources to create a Steve Jobs extravaganza, but you do have time to rehearse. The greatest presenters do it, and so should you. Oh, and one more thing. At the end of most presentations, Jobs adds to the drama by saying, and one more thing. One last thing. He then adds a new product or a feature, sometimes just introduces a band. This not only heightens the excitement, it also leaves your audience feeling they've been given an added bonus. The point is, Steve Jobs approaches each presentation as an event. A production with a strong opening, product demonstrations in the middle, and a strong conclusion. And yes, even an encore, that one more thing. I wish you a dazzling presentation. For more information, go to bnet.com.